We, uh, we have had, um, over the past two years, uh, a relationship between funder and recipient. Uh, we have a facility which is called the uh, Global Development Grant Facility, and uh, CORED slash the Global Forum for Health Research, the, after the merger, um, was the recipient of a grant from uh, the bank's Global Development Grant Facility. It was before given to uh, the Global Forum for Health Research when they merged, CORED became the eventual beneficiary. This is something which is uh, at the core uh, of, of what also what we are doing. I think you cannot do development without also doing research for development. Uh, you cannot invest in the health sector, for example, without doing also some uh, research uh, or you know supporting research uh, for health uh, in development. So I think that's a very natural uh, thing. There also, with regard to health and development uh, and the, the research component for it, there are market imbalances. I mean, there's a lot of research uh, in terms of pharmaceutical research because there's a commercial interest behind that. Uh, research in the interest of equity, for example, equity of access or universal coverage or many of these other kind of more uh, lofty goals uh, which don't have necessarily a, a, an immediate economic, um, uh, uh, economic benefit to someone. I think there you will find some market imbalances, so you do need to stimulate this type of research, and that's what we want to achieve with supporting it. I'm not, to be honest, uh, we are not great uh, fans of uh, uh, rigid targets for countries to achieve. Uh, I, I do know that the World Health Organization has called that uh, countries should fund health to the tune of 15 percent of uh, public expenditures, for example, at a minimum. Uh, that might be tr good and true for some countries. It might be good and true or not so good and not so true for other countries. As I think it's a very rigid, a very rigid boundary. Uh, uh, what we believe is important uh, is, is, uh, is a number of things to recognize. I mean, first, health outcomes are not only achieved through health inputs. So I think there are a number of health outcomes achieved by investments in other sectors than health, whether it's water and sanitation, whether it's education, whether it's transport, uh, whether it's you know, social protection. Uh, they all, a government can invest in those areas and achieve perhaps even more health outcomes, better health outcomes, more sustainable health outcomes, if they do that than invest in the health sector proper. So, I mean, this doesn't mean that you should not invest in your health sector. We also need health services, we need public health, etc. But I think we would be reluctant uh, to, to say, well, you can solve your problem simply by investing 15 percent of your public expenditures in health. I mean, that in and itself says nothing, because if these 15 percent are badly invested or wasted, you achieve nothing, you still spend 15 percent. If you invest 10 percent really well, really cost effectively, you might achieve more than, than many other countries who that spent double, double of the, that amount. In fact, is to a large degree a success story. I mean, we have had continuously improving uh, indicators uh, of social development, uh, whether it's health and education, social protection, what have you, over the last um, uh, decades. We have also, I think, increasing economic activities in those countries which have achieved a semblance of uh, civil peace and, and, and perhaps add on some semblance of democracy that helps in, in, in that context. So there are a number of countries which have done actually incre incredibly well. And I think that path is uh, to be followed. Uh, I, I think South Africa has done uh, really remarkably well in, in creating a, a peaceful society, uh, a country that is growing, a country which is seen as the leader. Uh, it's a G20 country uh, in, in, in a number of lead positions uh, globally. So I, I wouldn't be all that negative. Uh, and, and sometimes the bad news coming out of Africa overshadow uh, of some of the fantastic and very hopeful success cases which are actually more prevalent than the basket cases in Africa. I think m many funders, particularly grant funders, and we are not a grant funder. I think we, are, we need to be different. The World Bank, in that sense, we are different from bilateral agencies. I mean, we are an organization which we are owned by the same member countries. We are owned by all the African and international countries, which are the owners and masters uh, of our destiny. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, the way we work is that we do not give countries free resources. What we give countries is the ability to get resources 
through a mechanism which is called IDA resources, International Development Association, which are basically credits which are have a 10 years grace period, which have a, a 30 year repayment period, and which are interest free. Now, if you plug in the net present value, actually the cost of the money, it's about a two thirds grant, but it's not a 100% grant. So countries are very careful. On one hand, this is great, I mean, this is cheap money, but at the same time, countries are also aware eventually they need to repay that. So they're very conscious what they are doing with, this, with these resources. The whole uh, paradigm uh, really derives from a speech by our current World Bank president, uh, Robert Selig. Uh, he had a speech in front of uh, students at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he basically argued that uh, there's a new world order uh, which calls for a new multilateralism. It's a new multipolar world where the kind of the old, the old constellation of just simply Europe and uh, and and the United States determining the world order uh, is not valid anymore. Uh, the reason being is uh, what we have been seeing over the last decades the advent of, of many of the G20 countries, uh, which are now outpace in their economic development many of the kind of the old powers, uh, um, uh, whether it's the United Kingdom or France or Germany, Japan, etc., and the United States, of course. Um, so you see countries such as, uh, you know, China, India, Brazil, the BRICS countries, I mean, Russia, uh, and many of the other G20 countries, whether it's, you know, Indonesia, uh, uh, Thailand, etc., including also South Africa, really in terms of their economic development and in terms of their prominence on the world stage uh, to, to, to take a leadership position. And I think the point is that with that leadership position, these old kind of structures and, and, and past uh, mechanisms start to, to break apart. Now, one thing that Selig also mentions, uh, mentioned very clearly is that with this new power also comes uh, a new responsibility. And what we see is a number of countries actually taking on this responsibility, saying, all right, you know, we also have something to give. Uh, we need to lead. You know, we need to be a local pole of stability. We need to influence countries uh, in our backyard or surrounding us uh, in a positive way. Uh, we need to be part of a global community uh, uh, for certain global actions, whether it is climate change or whether it's international trade or whether it's uh, um, you know, uh, uh, global pandemics or what have you. So I think some countries, and I do believe also uh, South Africa, has stepped up to the plate and is now seen as a, as a leader in this kind of new club of, 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 of emerging uh, G20 economies. I was in the steering committee for the, for the Global Forum uh, uh, here and, and I have, from the very beginning on, uh, I, I was, a, I was a, a proponent uh, to give young people the voice and the opportunity to, 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 uh, to participate. Uh, this should not be a clo as so many conferences are, it's, a, it's kind of a, a closed, a closed um, uh, uh, session of delegates who have their, their name card and you, you, you can't get access otherwise, uh, etc. I think young people sometimes with their innocence, uh, you could call it even naivete to a certain degree, but it's a very important contribution to, to, to raise questions that we who always see our own little world through our tunnel view, we might never discover. And I have seen this happening a number of times. I enjoy working with young people. I also teach as a professor at universities. I always enjoy the kind of challenge that young people pose, sometimes asking very, very difficult questions and um, way more difficult than some of the, the, the usual pundits that you're exposed to. And I think that's what we need in a forum like this. And I think that's what we achieved with, with, with uh, inviting young people in. I think there are some, uh, there, there are some issues with regard to content and there are some issues in terms of logistics. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it was a very important event for CORED because, I mean, CORED as a newly merged organization was kind of the first time kind of a global business card was, was, was thrown on the table. This is, what, this is who we are, that's what we can do. And for that reason, I'm very happy that it was a success. If you talk to people, most people are happy and, 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 and then really found it very useful. And I think uh, it will be important for CORED to digest what happened, I mean, to learn the good, the bad, the ugly that happened here, uh, and, 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 pro and, and use these inputs for asking themselves, okay, so is this the right format 
uh, it, 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 was, it was for the Global Forum for Health Research, uh, not the first time uh, they did these global fora, but it was for the newly merged organization the first time. And so I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to listen, to evaluate, to see what worked, what didn't work, to really think about that and then use this as an input for the next time around. I think we have something which is really for me uh, always a, 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 one of the highlights every year which is uh, something which we organize every year, which is called the development marketplace, where we simply have a challenge. I mean, you, get, you, get, you, you can compete against other good ideas in front of a very high-level, high-powered jury with you know, just completely out-of-the-box, uh, innovative, interesting ideas. And it's just amazing what you see there. I mean, these, are, these are all ideas not from established researchers. These are not from Nobel Prize winning or high priced Harvard, Hopkins, what have you departments. These are from people, many times very young people all around the world, who come up with the most unbelievable ideas. And then uh, they propose those to a jury, and then they get resources to scale them up, and to, to, to make them happen. And then a year later, we come back and say, well, OK, so how did it work? And can you show the results? And I think that just shows the potential that, that, that young people have. Uh, so I think in addition, this, this, this of course cannot supplant the traditional research institutions. We still need them. But I think to have an extra forum with some extra resources to stimulate the thought process and tap into this kind of, uh, you know, out of the box thinking of young people is extremely valuable also for our sector for health in development. Many people have very little understanding, and how should they? I mean, who the World Bank is, uh, how were we founded, what are we doing, etc. I mean, the World Bank, if you think about it, is 60 years ago after World War II was founded with the purpose of rebuilding Europe. And once that job was done, there was a question raised, okay, so now what do we do with the capacity? And do we disband it, uh, or do we continue it and use it for something useful? And uh, at that time, it was decided I mean, to keep the institution and keep it growing uh, with a mandate of long-term development support for, for, for the countries that own it. And now, in the meantime, pretty much all the countries of the world own us. So basically, we are a credit union, if you will, of the countries of the world. So what we do is, for the richer countries, which are, have a, a, a GDP over $1,000, what we do, we go out for them to the global marketplace, raise resources, and on-lend it cheaper to them than they would get it on their own. So this is for countries, uh, um, uh, for, for the richer countries. For the poorer countries, every three years we go to the rich countries, we raise resources uh, from those countries, they pay that into this IDA fund, and that's the fund that I explained before, which is then accessible to countries. Now, one thing which is very uh, important for us, we do not tie our funding. So we do not say a certain percentage needs to go to agriculture or health or education. We approach a cabinet, a prime minister, a president, and say, okay, Mr. President, what are your priorities? And we negotiate this process every three years. We say, you know, okay, so if these are your priorities, we can help you here and here and here. We can provide financing and we can provide technical assistance. And so in a sense, we are a service institution to the countries of the world.